Yeah, so um, I want to welcome everyone to uh, this month's uh, meeting of the Houston Functional Programming Users Group. And uh, tonight we have Eric Norman uh, speaking. Uh, I think many, if not most of you know Eric. Um, he is very, very active in um, uh, primarily teaching functional programming. He has uh, one book, uh, Grokking Simplicity, which has been very, very well received. People talk about it um, all the time as being one of the most accessible um, texts out there on uh, learning functional programming paradigms. Uh, he is uh, currently working on a second book. He has a podcast, he has classes, he speaks all around the country, maybe the world. Um, and uh, this second book, he is talking a lot about on his podcast right now. Um, it's it's uh, if if you're not listening to it, I highly highly encourage it. It's 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 really nice stuff. Um, they're short pieces. He did really long ones for a while, and now these are really short ones, about ten to fifteen minutes. Um, and um, super nice guy. He presented, I don't know how long, two years ago, something like that. Um, he presented right when I sort of took over organizing the meeting and we were going online. And um, so we're really happy to have him back. Um, he and I have actually been corresponding over email recently, back and forth, and been having some very exciting discussions, at least from my perspective. Um, and I look forward to continuing that, and I'm very happy to welcome him back to um, the Houston Functional Programming Usements Group. So let's turn it over to you, Eric. Cool, thank you very much, Claude. Um, yeah, it is great to be here and it's great to be back. And um, it's cool to see meetups kind of starting up again and people sharing droplets and what have you with each other. Um, and uh, I guess I'm just gonna start. So like Claude said, I'm writing a book on domain modeling. It was originally supposed to be, I'll give you all some exclusives in this talk, so don't worry, you're getting some good stuff. Um, it was supposed to be part three of Grokking Simplicity, but I cut it uh, after finishing part two. It just didn't seem to be part of the story of Grokking Simplicity. Grokking Simplicity is sort of functional programming uh, how would I put it like if you you could start as a beginner and then have most of the skills that you needed to be a professional functional programmer by the end now of course you're not going to be good enough you got to practice and all that but it was all it was all in there and this is something domain modeling is something that I always thought was really important I've always loved it but I saw so many people not using it. <laughs> and so I figured if they can work professionally and not know about it, then it must not be like fundamental to being a functional programmer. So I decided to cut it out. Uh, and that fortunately let me publish the first book and finish it, wrap it up. And I still had this idea in me, so I, I've been working on it. and. Uh, I'm glad I did cut it out for that other reason because I'm still working on it. I published the Grokking Simplicity two years ago now, and uh, I'm still working on these ideas. So um, it, it it's taken longer than I thought. Okay, so my talk is trying to introduce the uh, main skills of domain modeling uh, what, that I can do in like an hour. Okay, um, let's go. So I have this thesis that software design has failed. What I mean by that is that software design is, is good. I practice it, I do it, and I read about it. But no matter how much people talk about it, we still have this problem. 
we still feel like our software is not designed well enough and um, it's kind of like a little cottage industry of people selling rules of thumb for how to make your software better and to solve the problems um, and well I'm gonna bring up a quote by a famous architect Christopher Alexander he's the person credited with uh, starting the pattern movement in architecture which was it's, it inspired the design pattern movements in software and he actually was invited to speak at Uppsala in 1996 and I'll just read this um, I began to notice by the late 70s some weaknesses in our work with patterns and the pattern languages by the late 70s I had begun to see many buildings that were being made in the world where when the patterns were applied I was not happy with what I saw it seems to me that what that we had fallen far short of the mark that I had intended but I also realized that whatever was going wrong wasn't going to be corrected by writing a few more patterns or making the patterns a little bit better uh, so in short they had all these patterns people were doing them but the architecture wasn't any better and when I hear that especially in a software context I think of stuff like this abstract singleton proxy factory bean which is actually a part of the spring framework it's real it's not a joke it is serious it's deadly serious <laughs> so um, I feel like the same thing has happened in the software design world people can follow the rules and still not get good design and to me that means it's broken uh, not the design is bad but that we just don't know how to do it and maybe we're even focusing on the wrong thing uh, so let's imagine this these white squares are our code it's we we don't like it it's all messy it's disorganized and we can start to point at stuff and say look there's too much coupling or there's too many classes or there's all these code smells right we're talking about the code look how messy it is it's just it's just a it's a jumble it's spaghetti the code is bad and so then we start cleaning it up and we add some indirection to get rid of the coupling we use the decorator pattern to remove some classes we refactor okay but it's less messy it's like we cleaned up our room but we're still just talking about the code we're not talking about what the code represents does the indirection that we just added correspond to anything in the real world like we've we've removed the coupling but like was there coupling in the world that we just like covered over does the decorator encode the possible states uh, I've seen some uses of decorator pattern especially in the books trying to explain it where they they take a thing where you know uh, the classic example is like coffee Starbucks coffee where you have like mocha almond soy latte with chocolate you know and you you can just add all these different add-ons to your coffee and they represent those with decorators and so then you've got these objects wrapping other objects that change their behavior but they can wrap in different orders but it's it just like explodes the number of combinations you can make so you don't have as many classes but you still have this problem of combinatorial explosion that doesn't represent anything in the real world um, and uh, you know we've refactored the code but it's maybe it's easier to find stuff but like does it actually correspond to how the world is um, so I propose that this is the main failure of software design is that it just tries to talk about the code just tries to clean up your existing code and what we should do instead is build a d domain model separate from our app functionality so domain modeling is a set of skills and practices we apply to encode our understanding of a domain separately 
from the software's explicit functionality. So your app functionality is like all your features, you know, oh, we need to be on this platform, that platform, we need to talk over JSON, you know, all those incidental decisions you have to make when you're building an app are very different from how you're gonna model the problem domain that you're trying to solve. And if you separate those out and then implement your app functionality in terms of that domain model, then what happens is you separate stuff based on the frequency of change. So your domain model is going to change much more rarely than your uh, app functionality. You know, new features happening all the time, changing existing features, that's going to change a lot. You want to separate that out from your understanding of the domain model. I think besides just making it, uh, separating those things out so that your maintenance cost is lower, it also could give you a competitive advantage. And I, I think that that's a, a, a leap that is hard to justify, but I've seen it happen at companies I've, I've worked at. And so if you can really find a good domain model that's better than your competition, you can iterate faster on your features uh, and so outcompete. Okay, I also want to, at this point, uh, I'm about to get into a different section. I forgot to mention, if you want to uh, shout out questions, please let me know. I can't watch the screen and like talk over my slides at the same time, so you got to make a noise so I can hear it. So uh, any I, questions? I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so you start off a couple of slides back saying that, that design has failed. Yeah. Right. So. Can you say more about what you think design is supposed to do and, and how, like, so I'm not sure I understand the claim that it failed without knowing what it was supposed to be doing in the first place. Right, right. So um, software design, I mean, this is one of the problems that I think you're, I've been investigating and, and trying to figure out what the original goals were of software design. Uh, it's very hard because most software design books do not give a definition of software design. Some do, or at least some give, give you the goal. Uh, and the goal that's most frequently cited is to uh, reduce maintenance cost of your software. So like reduce the cost of change, make it easier to find the bugs, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and it's a very pragmatic goal that can kind of cut out some of the fluff, but it's still, uh, well, I mean, when I read those books, it all still focuses on the code. It's sort of like, once you've written the code, you don't even think about the real world anymore. You're just like, let's mm -hmm. clean this up. Let's move it around, name things better. Um, you know, so, this, this me uh, method is too long. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, so I wonder whether that's actually okay, because you said, like, if software design is supposed to sort of deal with maintenance problems, that's not the world anyway, right? That's, maintenance problems exist within the software. Right, right. no, that that's a good point. And my, uh, th th this is the, I'm trying to create a connection between the quality of your model in the, in the sense of how well it captures reality and its need to change. Like if you find a good model, it will change very rarely. And so it's code that won't have to change. It'll be super it'll be solid in the sense of not, not that the software design solid, but it will, um, it, it will, it will handle cases that you haven't thought of. Uh -huh. okay. And we're, we're going to get into how we can do that. This is one of the skills that we go through. So I, 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 I believe that I am making a big leap and I am really trying to uh, connect the dots 
So please do keep asking these questions um, because I, I really do want it to be very clear. Um, and I, I, I also feel like this is a, um, a great opportunity because I actually clarified a lot of my ideas just making these slides. So thank you so much. So can, can we move on? And maybe you can ask after you see some more of it. Okay. So there's some teaching challenges uh, that I'm addressing in the book. Um, you know, I don't want to just start typing things that I believe. I actually feel like it's important to encode stuff. So I want to explain a little bit about why I think that it's a challenge to shift mindset to go back to like the world. Okay, so here is a, a kind of a model of a model, right? You have your domain. Let's say we're talking about coffee shops. You have the domain of coffee, which is just this amorphous thing. You know, you just there's coffee, you can make it, there's beans, you roast them. It's like not very clear how you would encode that in a computer or what even you need to encode. And so you have to do some intellectual work and figure out a conceptual model of how you, you know, if you're a business, how your business is going to think of coffee, right? Okay, we're going to sell it in three different sizes, and we're going to have three different roasts, light, medium, and dark. And we'll keep it simple. We'll just stop there. There's obviously other stuff, but we'll stop there. And then you're going to take that conceptual model, and you're going to turn it into an encoding some way of representing it in memory on on over the network maybe in a database those kinds of things when you need them so this is just saying size this is a closure so size can either be small medium or large it's closure ish because that uh, pipe symbol doesn't mean anything roast can be light or medium or dark okay so what's going to happen is you're constantly jumping back and forth between these. And if you start on a project, you might be anywhere on these, this spectrum of stuff. You might be, you know, with the, the guy who started Starbucks and like, you haven't really figured out this simplified coffee model. And, um, you have, you're going back to the domain and really, uh, figuring that, conceptual model out or you might be joining Starbucks 10 years in and they already have it down and they just need a new POS system that you have to find the encoding for right so you learn the conceptual model and learn how to encode it and sometimes you've already you're already got the encoding and you realize hey we missed this thing in the domain way at the left we're going to actually have to go back and even change our conceptual model and our encoding it's so like you're 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 gonna be moving between these quite a lot okay at the same time you're moving around in the language so what happens when we learn a language you got java it's just got a bunch of features and it's got a giant spec and you learn to use the features in certain ways so you say well, interfaces that kind of lets you start an is a hierarchy classes it's how you model your entities Oh, methods, you start with your getters and setters, and then you add some custom behavior. Got enums, but we don't talk about those too much. We got fields, that's for has a relationships, et cetera, et cetera. You, you, people, because the language is so big and they learn, they have to learn it in some order and some method so that they can get work done, they tend to learn these things. And this is a big learning challenge. Uh, and then, of course, you just take those things and you you code. And so there's kind of a modeling process in the is a and has a uh, way that Java programmers are taught. And that's the learning challenge is that they're going to have to unlearn that. They're going to have to go back to their language and rebuild this middle mapping, this usage mapping. So again, even after you've built it, you're going to have to go back to the language quite a lot and so then these two things converge on the app right that's the encoding and uh, well I just wanted to show that they all they go together and you're gonna be jumping around through all these things 
while while you're d doing domain modeling. Okay, uh, so to address these teaching challenges, uh, I've come up with three levels. Um, they're they're levels because I I feel like the they go in like order of the most basic and fundamental uh, to the most abstract. Um, and each one, the part of the way I've tried to address the challenge of teaching it is to give, to give a focus so that instead of thinking about, you know, where's the has a relationships and the is a relationships, people start looking in a different place because we tend to want to jump straight into writing code and we need to disrupt that and give them something for their brain to do while they're doing that. So each one has a focus and it has a goal as well uh, for like what we're trying to achieve at that level. So the three levels are data modeling, operation modeling, and algebraic modeling. And we'll go through all three. Uh, the point, yeah, uh-huh. You put level one data modeling. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine data modeling without knowing how it's used. But just keep going. We'll talk later. Okay. Uh, yeah, I bring that back up after if uh, sure. if I haven't answered it. Okay. So in in level one, we're focusing on the relationships among values. Uh, this is again to give your keep your mind busy so you're not jumping into like typing class dog. Uh, extends animal like the first thing you think of right um, because that's where people are at uh, that's how we get those abstract I don't even remember abstract proxy factory method or pra factory factory anyway uh, okay so these are the values that we have uh, in our small coffee domain right We've got the three sizes and the three roasts and I mean, I think for this kind of domain, it's very clear because it's already pre-constructed. It's already, you know, digitized, um, discretized. Uh, these three things have a different relationship to each other than they do from to the others, right? So these three belong together. These three belong together. It's very clear. I don't think I have to dwell on that. But there is a relationship between the two. Uh, it's just like a weaker relationship. So we should characterize that relationship. So with these sizes, we're going to choose one among many. If we're building a coffee, right? If we're trying to describe a coffee, we will have to choose one of those. So it's small or medium or large. And I'm calling that relationship where you choose one among many an alternative. You have many choices, but you can only choose one. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for the roast. But then at the bottom, the size and the roast, we're going to choose one of each. So we're not choosing one or the other. We're choosing one and one. So size and roast. And I'm calling this one a combination. Okay, so we're able to combine multiple values together into a single value. Um, okay, so now we're trying to, this is our goal now, once we've done that analysis, we're going to take these features on the right from closure, because that's the language we're using. So we're going to take these features and try to figure out which ones can encode the alternatives and combinations that, w that we need. So I'm just going to do it like as an example we could choose keywords it's not the only way to do it but we're going to choose keywords for the three choices in the size alternative also the three choices in the roast alternative but then our combination we're going to use maps uh, and that way we can combine the two together there's different ways you could do it and i uh at this point right now, it's just, can you do it? Uh, we can evaluate it later. Uh, and just to say, like, I know, geez, I put this on here and it just like looks so basic and so dumb. Like who would do it any other way? Well, um, 
Java people probably would. So I'm going to give just a little example of how we might do it in Java. This is actually kind of a good way. Uh, you would have a class coffee as representing your combination. That's at the bottom. And it has a size component and a roast component. And each of those is just an enum. Okay. So that's pretty simple. That's, that's one way to do it. Uh, and so you notice I, I brought up this idea of alternative combination. And um, I think that there's a bunch of these data modeling elements that are, I, 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 hate, I hate this kind of thing where it's like, well, you need this long list of things to learn, to look for while you're data modeling. I wish it was much smaller, um, but uh, this is the current state that I've got it in. Uh, and if you see any way to <laughs> reduce this down, um, please help me. But, um, right, so this, the alternative combination we talked about, uh, we're about to talk about collections, so I'm gonna leave that off for a minute. Uh, mapping, that's uh, a way of taking one value and getting another from it. And then optional is a way of saying we may or may not have a value. Uh, the atomic ones are pretty pretty clear. Identifiers, counts, measures, dates, text. And part of the idea is to, to make it very language neutral and not use any particular type because that if you use a type, then you're basically saying use that type. And that's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, sometimes the language provides a type that is exactly the same as one of these. Um, and in those cases, it's, it's pretty clear. But um, in some cases, the thing that's called that, like that's called a, I don't know, like an optional, it might not be exactly the same. Okay, so I'm, I'm hoping to make a big like inventory of these things. This is where I'm at so far. Okay, uh, so let's make it a little more complicated, take the same data model, but add a new thing. This time, just like at Starbucks, there's all these things you can add to your coffee. Uh, we'll just keep it down to five, just for ease. So you can add an espresso shot, almond, hazelnut, soy milk, or cream. Now, what is the relationship among these things? It's a little different from, from what we've seen before. Uh, so before we saw that it, uh, we, we saw that you would have this alternative thing, but then there was only one. But you can have an espresso shot and soy milk, and you can even do like double espresso shots. So there's something else going on here. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to compose up that idea from these elements. So first we'll make an alternative. So we'll call this an add-in. It's an alternative. You choose one of those. And then we're going to make a collection, which is you choose zero to three of those add-ins. So that means you could have almond and espresso. And I did zero to three because uh, we're, I'm just assuming that you uh, that the business would say no more than three because that just makes it easy on the slides uh, and then you would add it to the combination so now your combination includes size and roast and add-ins so then of course you go back to your language you've done the analysis and you say well uh, all our, our t alternative is going to be keywords like the other one and we're going to use a vector for the collection so we can have almonds and soy and then we're going to add it to the map which is our combination and so we'll have add-ins with almond and soy was that a question i heard just something okay all right um right so here's the thing we got to evaluate whether our our encoding, our data model down here at the bottom is, is any good. And one way we can do that is to count up the combinations. 
So just of this small piece, just of this add-ins part, we have five possible add-ins. How many combinations uh, do we have of like when we use the collection of them? So we have the empty vector that gives us one. Uh, we have five if we just have a single one in a vector. So total six so far. Uh, and then we're, if we have two in a vector, that'll give us 25. And then if we add three, we have 125. So we add all of these up, and that gives us 156 combinations. Okay, so we, we can actually represent 156 different combinations of, I'm, I feel bad because I'm using the word combination, uh, which I shouldn't but we're using 156 of them we have 156 different states that that coffee can be in however we counted some of them twice and some of them three times so here's one that we counted twice almond with soy and soy with almond those are the same coffee right they're going to mix together it doesn't matter what order you put them in and this one we counted three times almond soy 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 almond soy 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 almond so uh how many of those did we count twice? Actually, there's only 156 unique combinations. So if you sort them and then throw them into a set, you only get 56 at the end. So this is like an objective way to analyze our domain model, um, or sorry, our data model, to see if we, how many extra states do we have? Because we're gonna have to deal with those at some point. Because you're going to say, well, are these two coffees equal? You're going to have to figure out how to change them to like a normal form. Okay, so what do we do with this mismatch between our data model and the domain model, the conceptual model? Well, we can live with it. We can just like throw if statements all over the code, figure out how to... Um, you know, maybe we refactor it eventually so that we don't duplicate stuff everywhere, but we're still going to have to worry about it all the time. Uh, and so I think this answers your question. I don't remember who asked it, but it, it, it's kind of an answer to the question that like bad data models, you know, I was talking about good data models, but bad data models force you, if you don't, if you don't, uh, think about them and, and fit them tightly to the conceptual model, they will often cause you to spew if statements all around your code to deal with the disconnect between how you're modeling reality and the reality itself. So that's, that's a, a way that it leads to better design. Uh, we could find a new representation. So if your language has a thing called an ordered list that I just made up, you could throw them in an ordered list that keeps it ordered. And so that way, the equality is easy to, to see and you don't have to deal with it elsewhere. Like your data structure is taking care of it. Uh, and that's actually kind of a new, uh, kind of a, a great way to do it. Uh, we could change the conceptual model. Uh, we could go back and say, oh, I don't know how to code that. So please, can we change the business? Uh, and you could say, well, we're, well, you're, maybe you're not changing the business, but you're changing how you uh, analyzed it. So instead of saying, oh, it's a collection, we're going to use a mapping of identifiers to counts, right? So now, instead of saying almond, soy, soy, we're gonna say soy two, almond one. And because we're using a hash map, the order of the keys doesn't matter. And we've got the count in there, right? that's that's included in the value so we're kind of encoding the same information but now we don't have this problem of being able to encode the same thing in two different ways soy almond al soy almond soy and soy soy almond are the same okay and now um, so that that could be an improvement and then sometimes you have to go back and revisit the domain um, and this actually should say revisit the conceptual model so revisit the domain. We could just say no duplicates allowed. Now we get to use a set and you can't have two soy shots in your, in your coffee. Um, that's kind of extreme. 
and we, we, we wouldn't want to impose that on the customer most of the time. Okay, and just in case uh, I haven't I haven't been fair to all the bad code out there uh, that I've been showing like pretty clean code. Um, here is a way you could implement it in Java. Uh, you could make a class coffee and then use an int to represent the three different sizes. You know, zero is small, one is medium, two is large. Uh, same for the roast. You could have zero is light uh, and one and two for the other two. And then you could just like list as fields all the different add-ins. So kind of hard code them in there as ints, right? Now, you could do that. I see a ton of problems with this. I bet you do too. But I mean, it, it could work if given enough code to work with that, you could do it. Uh, and you know, just imagine like the first, the, like the the Java util date class and how it uses zero to represent January. I mean, you could do it. Okay. All right. Any questions before I move on? Uh, do you mind if I just jump in? Yeah. Quick one. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, it occurred to me just before that I guess when you were talking about choosing the right structures, I guess, to represent certain data. Um, and then I noticed, so you, when you pick keywords for these, um, you know, you have keywords in each of these cases, mm. there's not necessarily something <clears throat> like that structure doesn't, as far as I know, I'm not a very familiar with closure, but it doesn't show that the three sizes that are keywords are somehow related or mm. the three roasts, right? So then is that something that you would handle in another place in the model? Or is that something that would make you think like maybe those need to be put into some sort of collection that shows that this is the exhaustive domain or all possibilities where right. otherwise you might not have that idea or might not know, you know, right. what's going on there. Right. So you're, you're talking about, um, uh, I mean, it sounds like you're talking about validation uh, in in some sense of like, did I give it a size that is, you know, I gave it a keyword. Is it one of the three sizes uh, that I'm expecting? Um, yeah, and that's that's a thing. Like yeah, exactly. different languages provide different uh, features for, for checking those things. Uh, and so you'd have to go to your language and, and decide how am I going to enforce these things? Uh, something like Haskell, you would probably use a discriminated union and it just, you know, will work. It'll have the three sizes as part of a type and it'll only allow those three things, uh, you know, at static compile time. Closure, you would probably use something, some kind of dynamic check, maybe spec or um, one of the newer ones. Uh, I can't remember the name offhand, Molly that that does that kind of check and you'd have to yep. you know you'd have to do it um you could do it ad hoc right you could have a set of them uh that's like this is the exhaustive set but you know what oh. it could also be that um you want to be able to store them in the database and add and remove sizes pretty frequently and you don't want it to be a type you want it to be some dynamic value that it reads from the database. You know, the exhaustive set of sizes can change, and so we're going to do that. Uh, certainly for the add-ins, you'd probably want to do that. You can, like, do a seasonal add-in, or, mm -hmm. like, if you run out, you could, like, scratch it off the list, um, which would be hard to do if it was encoded in a type, right? And I do want to yeah. get into that in the book, uh, talking more about, like, volatility and what can change. Uh, right. But I don't think I have time for that uh, tonight. But does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's yeah. great. Awesome. That's awesome. kind of what I was wondering. Um, right. So, a part of part of me is like a little happy, a little giddy that it seems it seems to me that I'm getting at something a little bit more objective when we're counting the states. Um, when you're counting the states. 
it's it's a very numerical thing and you can then have to reference reality reference your conceptual model and um, count those states and compare the two and any mismatch is going to require extra code that's that's my contention um, and uh, we didn't talk about it but you know I said you could sort that vector and I'm calling that a normalized function that's kind of like a very common thing to do so you have two values and you need to normalize them uh, so that you can compare them um, you know normalizing meaning putting them into if two things well if two things represent the same thing in the conceptual model then they will be encoded in the same normal form that's what the normalize does and then there's validate uh, which m makes sure that it the thing that you've the piece of code the piece of data you have is something representable <laughs> in your conceptual model Right, you don't want something that doesn't make sense from your conceptual model. Uh, okay, level two. Um, how are y'all feeling? Because I, it's hard to tell on on Zoom. You following? F feeling good? I'm good. Skeptical, mm -hmm. bored, throughout some. No, we're feeling good because there's free beer here. <laughs> well, that doesn't make me feel good. You could get that anywhere. <laughs> Or you could have I think we're a couple time. hours earlier, so that's that also helps here. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to, have, I'm trying to form a coherent opinion. So yeah. ask an intelligent question. Yeah. Now all that right. I see all right. model, I'm getting it a little yeah. more. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Sorry if I'm fading because it's eight o'clock here. Uh, all right. So level two. The, this I won't take as much time with, uh, and level three as well. Um, I felt I feel like that's the fundamental thing is data modeling that people aren't very good at it and uh, it's much more important to be able to do that so what happens is you build all these data models and you see that well I have all these choices still I could use a vector or I could use an ordered list or I could represent it like a map and it's so hard to choose uh, it's not clear what's better and also, sometimes you build your data model and then you go to write a function with it and you're like, oh, I can't, it's not really very easy. It's kind of awkward to do this one use case that's really important. And this happened to me. I eventually realized, well, I should look at all the use cases first before I even look at my data model. Um, now, you can't do that if you're not already good at data modeling because then you're like off in la la land. Um, you can't get back but if you know how to data model I suggest you write out all your use cases and even turn them into uh, function signatures so here's a use case we want to be able to take two coffees and know if they're the same coffee so we'll write a function called coffee equals that takes two coffees and returns a boolean okay so well, by function signature I'm talking about the function's name, the arguments and their types, and this is just inferred from the name of the argument uh, in, in closure, and the return value, or return type. Uh, and here I have to put a comment because we don't have static type annotations in closure. Okay, so we have another use case. How many espresso shots does a coffee have? So I think anybody could write this in this room. How many, question mark, takes a coffee and an add-in. So I'm generalizing it. Here, this, the use case was like espresso shots, but I'll say, no, I'll make it an argument, and it'll return a natural number, right? Zero or more. Uh, maximum number of add-ins. So we want to know if, we want to say that, like, no more than four add-ins. Uh, and we might as well put a min while we're at it. So let's do, uh, without lim within limit, takes coffee, and a min and a max, and returns a boolean, right? So that's going to satisfy our use case. And uh, add add-in. So we take a coffee and an add-in to add, and it returns a modified copy of that coffee. Functional programming, of course, so we're going to do immutable stuff. Uh, and then uh, remove does the opposite, removes one from the coffee. And there's probably more use cases, but, you know, 
time and all that. Okay, so now let's compare the vector version and the map version. Remember the vector version had the add-in. This is the only difference, that the add-ins are in a vector, and so you have this ambiguity with the order versus the add-ins have the name of the add-in and the count inside. So coffee equals and coffee equals are the same. They're just using regular equals. Um, this is assuming that coffee A and coffee B are both normalized, okay? Because it's kind of easy to it's kind of easy to uh, assure that you're always normalized when you're always using your your methods. All right, how many? <laughs> Was someone moaning from disgust with my talk? <laughs> uh, okay, so this is uh, how many. Um, so, oh, oh, I didn't do this one right. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how many for this one should be much simpler. Uh, can I edit it? No. Oh, that's editing the notes. Well, anyway. Um, so this is, this you have to do like over the list. You have to filter out the ones that match the add-in and then count them. This one, I messed up. This is, this code is wrong. You actually just need to grab it out of the map, but with a default ver value of zero, right? Um, within limit. Well, this one you have to count, but this one, look, I did it wrong again. Oh man, I'm very sorry. Uh, I actually want to edit it. Can I do that? Okay, let's do it live. Can you still see it? Did it stop sharing? You stop sharing. It stopped sharing. Okay, so this should just be uh, how many should be get out of the add ins of the coffee, add in with the default of zero. Okay. Uh, now the within limit is going to be a little harder now because we're going to actually have to add up all the values. So we're going to have to take, I'll just do it like this, reduce plus zero the vowels, the values of that map. Does that make sense? The values are going to be two and one and we're just going to sum them all up starting at zero and check if it's less if it's less than max and greater than min okay now can i play this from where i was did i lose did you lose the sharing again no we can still see it you saw it you see it okay it says screen sharing is paused. Uh, paused. Oh, yeah, it hasn't moved. It has not changed. The screen is not moving. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cool. All right. So that's he's going to change back on the next slide, which is unfortunate, but I'll just keep going. Uh, so in this one, when we add on the left for the vector, um, we have to do something uh, kind of easy. We're going to just call conj. Oh, this is not easy closure code. I'm sorry. Could have been easier. We're going to we're going to add it to the vector, then sort the vector, which returns a list. So we're going to have to turn it back into a vector. But we can do that all in one line. The map version is much easier. We're going to just increment it with the default value of zero. So if it doesn't find it in the map, it'll start at zero and then increment. Because maps are easier that way. And then when we get to remove, well, we have to do a linear search. So I just wrote this loop uh, to go through the list. I'm not going to read all the code and just compare it to this where in, in the in the map version, you only have three lines. All you have to do is you check the one case because you want to get rid of the zeros. You don't want them in the map. 
Uh, so you got to check if you're at one and you're going to, you're just going to remove it from the map. But if you're at more than one, you're going to decrement. Okay. So all of this is to say like the implementations will help you figure out which one to do. You have a lot more information about what are the trade-offs. You had some trade-offs with the vector that you had to sort and you had to do linear searches, but with the map, there was maybe a linear thing where you had to sum up, you know, when you did the within limit to count the stuff, but everything else seemed much easier. But I think as you get better at programming, you don't even have to implement them. You can just look at the signatures and just one at a time think, oh wait, huh, that's a linear search, huh? Because I'm on a vector. And this one, that's a sum, a linear sum. Do I have to do that? And this one is a linear search too, you know, and you can kind of weigh all this in your mind, just looking at the signatures. So that's the focus of, of level two is looking at the signatures without the implementation can give you a ton of information. Uh, if you're, if you've got some experience programming and if you don't, you can just always implement it and see which one is more complicated. Okay, so another important idea that I almost left out but needs to be in here is that in when we're doing operation modeling, we want total functions. Uh, total function is a function that is defined for all valid arguments. And by defined, it means it doesn't throw an exception and it doesn't do some undefined behavior. It, if, you, if it looks like you can pass it to that function, you should be able to. And I don't, I don't want to get into a, a whole debate about static versus dynamic typing here. If you got it, usually what happens is static types correspond to the the notion of valid argument, but not always, right? Sometimes you use an int even though it's does it should it shouldn't accept negative numbers. Uh, and dynamic typing, you don't even have checks; you just have to rely on um, common sense. So. Um, just as an example, there's this issue with remove. What if we try to remove soy from a coffee that doesn't have coffee? Or we try to remove soy, yes, that's why I said soy from a coffee that doesn't have soy, right? It's got no add-ins in it. What do we do? Um, there's actually three options. There's always only three options. One, we can restrict the arguments, meaning we can somehow restrict that this add-in has to be in the coffee. Uh, we can augment the return value. So we can say, well, sometimes you're going to return nil, right? Um, and, uh, or we could change the meaning. So let's look at this. So the first one is restrict the arguments. So we could just say that, no, this is not even allowed. Do not call this uh, with soy because it's not in the add-ins list. It's it's undefined, like or not. It's not undefined. It's not a valid argument. So somehow you have to do a check beforehand. You're, um, you're right. So you could do this in closure. You can make a precondition, and you could say that how many is going to have to be positive to call this. Okay. So what you're doing is you're making some combination of arguments invalid. You're forcing the caller to check the arguments before calling. Like there's no other way around it. This is going to throw an exception if you don't, if you don't check beforehand. And uh, it makes the function total though, because you've changed the notion of valid arguments. Um, so that's possible. It's a possibility. Um, it's probably not, it's usually not the best usually not the best because you're just forcing an if statement before like what's the point of that and you're always going to need to do it anyway uh, the second way to make something total oh are y'all familiar with total functions by the way the the concept have you heard of this before well it's the first time i've ever heard of it first time okay so this is you know a function this is a concept in in math so it's it's also talked about in in functional programming. So I'm, I'm this isn't something I'm making up. Um, eh, 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's keep going. Um, so you could augment the return value with an extra state indicating failure. That's what I did here. You could say, well, sometimes we're going to return nil if we couldn't actually remove the add-in. Okay. And then um, finally, we're going to force, oh, and then this forces the caller to deal with it after. So you've got to have an if statement after the call to handle that nil value. And that's not the only way you could handle it, but you always have something to, to handle when you augment the return value. Okay, finally, you could change the meaning. You could say, listen, we're just remove, yes, like it doesn't really correspond to anything in a coffee. You can't remove soy from a coffee that doesn't have soy in it. But remember, we're not dealing with coffees. We're dealing with descriptions of coffees, usually for making an order. And so if you add soy to your order, you can remove it. And what does it mean to press the remove soy button uh, on the POS, um, you know, that the, that the server is using to punch in your order? They press it one too many times. There's no soy in that order, but they still pressed it. What does that mean? Well, it should just be a no op, right? You're, you're just saying that some combination of arguments return an unchanged coffee. It's just a no op. And then the nice thing about it is all checks are contained in the function. You don't, it, you don't have to make it an error just because it, um, uh, just because it, it doesn't seem like you want to do it. And some languages, some languages have it. I mean, it usually doesn't happen anymore, but like in the eighties, some of the languages, if you had a string and you said something like, um, remove all or replace all T's with S's, but it didn't have any T's, it would throw an error, right? And that's kind of like, we think of that as ridiculous now. Like if you know there's no T's in it, just like shut up, you know, just deal with it. <laughs> I just wanted to remove all of them. I didn't need to check first to see if there were T's. Um, uh, because that's what you're going to do. You're going to write a wrapper function that checks first and then removes them if they found any. So might as well just make that part of the part of the domain model. Okay, another example of using total functions. Um, I used this the other day, actually. You, you're writing an HTTP client for some API, and you're going to get errors. Like, there's no way around it. You gotta, you gotta deal with them. So you can't. There's some things you can't do. You can't restrict the arguments to get rid of a timeout. Like it's out of your control. You can get rid of some things, right? Like if there are some known like query params that you need to use and some that you can't use, like you can restrict those, but timeouts you can't you can't avoid them. Uh, you can augment the return. Uh, but you can't change the meaning. Like the meaning is like make this call so there's um, there's no, there's no way around that one either so we can do number two and I do this often uh, in, you have a you augment the return value by having different statuses so instead of throwing an exception if there's a 500 error you're going to return either a map that has a value so the, the key status is going to say success and then it's going to have the value and whatever JSON value comes back from your API. Or you're going to have status error, and then there's going to be a code and a message. And of course, you might want to change this into an exception later. So you have this function called value or error that takes the response. If it uh, has, if the, if the status is success, you're going to just pull the value out and return it. But if the status is error, then we're going to throw the exception at that point. So I like this because it separates out um, what you want to do with it. Because at some points, you're like, yes, I'm in a safe place. I'm doing a lot of I.O. I just want to throw an exception and get out of here. But other times, you don't. You want to actually look at it and examine it. And you don't want to be dealing with tries and catches. 
so when you're modeling uh, operations, you want to have a precise, complete, and minimal set of meanings. Uh, these are the kinds of values that you want to to converge on. You need to you need to have totality of functions because you're going to be building on it later, and you don't want to have to deal with all those if statements of checking the arguments and stuff. Um, and uh, I I believe that there's some thing some encoding some data models where it will be impossible or very complex to implement some of your use cases, uh, and so you're going to have to revisit your data model, and you want to do that sooner rather than later. That's why you should look at your operations first and try to implement them. Whew, okay, we've just got one level left. And this one is the shortest in the slides. Quick, quick question before yeah. you move on. <clears throat> Are you going to cover in your book or touch on like dependent types as like a fourth method of handling this sort of solution? It's a sort of like pushing the restriction of the arguments to the to the type system. Um, so I will probably mention dependent types. I don't think of it as a different way from the three um, what it's doing is letting you do these kinds of uh, it's doing the restricting the arguments in a smarter way so that in some cases you can avoid an if statement before so you could write a type that says this function takes a coffee an add-in has to be in the coffee. And in some code paths, it can tell that that add-in is in the coffee. But if you're dealing with a POS where people are pressing buttons um, you know, to the computer, it seems, randomly, um, this, there's not going to be any code paths where it can guarantee that it's in there. Um, or not, not in that you know, loop that's going on, that event loop of the button presses. Uh, so you're still going to have to have an if statement. And that if statement will carry through, right? The if statement will check that it's in there, and then the type system will be happy. Yes, you checked. So I know in this code path you're, you're, you're satisfying the type. Um, yeah. They're just better types. They're not you know so eric i have a I have another question yeah okay so i'm confused about the relationship between level two and level one because if, if we went if you go back a couple of slides mm -hmm. to the yeah so removing the soy from yeah. coffee that doesn't have soy so I guess part of level one was you were you were trying to make this case of like trying to model the real world more closely. Mm -hmm. But then but then this part seems like a big concession or a bit of a turnaround because you said like like um at, at any real life you actually would have to check whether coffee has soy before you remove it from coffee, yeah. right? Uh -huh. So, good question. The, the way that you, uh, I guess, the best way that you came up with was doing the check internally for the function, right? Mm -hmm. So that the caller doesn't have to to do the if statement before or after, right? So, I guess I'm confused. What the focus on reality got us in this case? That's a good question. Yeah. So remember, we're not trying to model coffees, right? We're trying to mo model information about coffees. We're trying to model coffee orders. Uh, I mean, usually that's it. It's ordered before it's ordered, right? Or after to like look at reports of like how many soy coffees were ordered. Um, so we're, we're dealing it with information. We're not dealing with coffee. Um, and so this real world that this thing has to deal with is the 
uh, like cash register, the ordering system that the server is pressing on. And in okay. reality, they are going to press the soy button one too many times and remove more than one, more than, you know, all the soys. And we're going to have to deal with that. And so we're just baking that into our model. Okay, so operations, like the, the reality is, is different. Yes. The reality, you can't remove soy from coffee. You dump it out and make another one. No, but can, can, can I jump in here? Yeah. Because I, I think um, this also hits on, unless I'm misunderstanding what you're saying and asking, um, this hits on point three of change the meaning. So it's it may not be about removing soy, it may be about ensuring that the coffee doesn't have soy in it mm. or ensuring that the coffee only has one soy added and that's yeah. a different thing from the process of removing soy hey hey claude can i jump in here for a second of course so, <laughs> this entire discussion is completely different depending on whether you're writing the inventory system or the point of sale system mm-hmm Right? Think about that for a minute. If you're writing the inventory system, you don't want to count all those negative soys. Right? Because they didn't do anything in the real world. Mm -hmm. Right? So the thing I would say is that you really need to understand the part of reality you're modeling. Because we don't, we don't model all of reality. And if you ever try to write one of those systems where you do all of it at once, <laughs> it's complicated, right? Imagine trying to keep it straight. Like you need to know what you sold, right? Somebody cares about that, mm -hmm. but somebody else cares about how much soy added they need to order mm -hmm. for next week, right? So. I think all of these things you talk about are really important. They have to be plugged into what your what the system is doing. Because there's quite a few different ways to look at a coffee shop. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, and I, I, I think that you're, you're making a really good point. Um, so there's a thing that I say a lot and I stopped saying it because people were like, it's so trite, but I, it seems relevant now. Like, I wish that in, in like the OO modeling world, instead of calling the class person, they should call it person record because <laughs> it's like a record of some information about a person that your software cares about. It's not trying to simulate a person. It's just trying to group some data together that's you know, happens to be related through the person and it's a record. And we, in, in the OO world, at least the way I was taught, I feel like, you know, they have to teach it in a certain way. Like they need to babify it as like paint by numbers or it's like finger painting, right? When, when, when we we're taught programming in school, but like eventually you have to just discard that and look back at, the reality and the reality is we're not simulating people you know <laughs> in a little like marionette style we're we're uh shuttling information around and we um we need to like i don't know we just we i think as an industry we need a reckoning with that like we shouldn't call it coffee we should call it coffee order we should you know some it's a piece of information it's not a coffee um and yeah anyway thank Unless you you're writing a simulation you're actually trying yes. to simulate a person then the public person right. matches right it, it's a model right it's a model so, that's right but we're not modeling and so we're using the tools that we would model a person to model something that's not a person Yeah, I used to get upset with people because a place I worked, we had a create employee function. 
And I used to argue that none of the people in the room had ever created a, an employee, but I had because my son happened to work for the same company. <laughs> and oddly enough, that is true again. <laughs> I always like to use the example of uh, when you, you go to a supermarket, you don't send a buy message to a broccoli. Like, <laughs> but that's how we're taught, right? Like, yeah. oh, it's the verb. It either goes on the person or it goes on the the the, the product. I'm like, no, that's not what's happening. <laughs> what's happening is I put this broccoli in my shopping cart and bring it to the cashier. Like, there's like an information transfer going on that that is what you really should be modeling. Um, anyway, um, maybe that's what my book should be. It's just a long rant about that stuff. Hi. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I'm sorry, what's your name back there with the glasses and the drink, and the blue shirt that asked the question? No. Um, you. Yeah, behind Claude. Yeah. Oh, Anthony. Anthony. Yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question? Does the Sorry. reality of does it, let me ask it another way? Does the reality of a coffee order make more sense? Don't ask him about reality. He's a philosopher. <laughs> ah, okay. So we're not modeling a coffee, and we never were, really. So I guess I I guess that was my disconnect because I thought that that's what the domain the part part one was about. Um, I thought you were you know you wanted to get into like you know reality reality right <laughs> in some sense it is the reality of the business of selling yeah 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 yes. it's like yeah yes. it's the, and that's why i called it the conceptual model it's like what's happening in your head you need to get that out of your head and un, into your software and um the the challenge all right let me let me before i talk about the challenge let me give you a little scenario so you go to the coffee shop and you read the menu. So you're kind of interpreting this menu as a possible set of coffees you could order. So that forms your conceptual model. You somehow decide, it's magic, let's call it, and you decide what you want and you say it out loud to the, to the uh, server. The server, so, you, so you're transferring information vocally to the server. The server understands your words and forms a new model in their head of what you want. Then they press all the buttons. So that's, well, let's say they don't press buttons. So let's not involve computers. They write it down. So they're, again, encoding it back from a conceptual model into some information recording, you know, words on paper. They hand it to the barista. The barista reads it, forms a new conceptual model of the coffee that you want, then makes the coffee. That's also magic. So then, they, then you get this coffee. Okay. So they're encoding their conceptual model of your coffee want into a real coffee. Are you including the steps to translate from? their mental model to using the machine <laughs> no that's magic that's not because using the machine is a different model at whatever you show up yes. you say i'd like to order and then they start typing and you gotta wait you don't say a single word until they stop typing because they're logging in <laughs> so this is a great they're logging, in. Like <laughs> they're logging in the machine and it takes them like 30 seconds if you say any words they're going to forget them okay right. so next time they're a little better but you have to like one at a time tell them, i want this hamburger modified i want it rare sorry y'all and i want it no bun so you have to wait in between because they are just typing away can All I right. say the model of where you're ordering food is flawed? <laughs> you, you need no, to go to better. I was very high quality. I highly commend it. Uh, there's one nearby. <laughs> there, yeah. There's actually two nearby. One on West Harbor. <laughs> right. So okay. So so what this is to me, what this scenario is saying is that there is a series of encodings and decodings 
of conceptual models going on. And eventually you get your coffee and you can know if it's right because if you remember what you ordered, you can compare, you can read the coffee, you know, you can look at it. Oh yeah, it's got the milk I wanted. It's the right roast smell it however you decide you taste it and, and you compare it to your mental model and you say yes that is the same right so you're there's a final decode at the end when you drink it uh, now if you're gonna insert a computer into it let's say instead of writing it down on paper you press some buttons that creates a the, the computer interprets those button presses into some internal model and it's got a conceptual model that the programmers had when they coded it. It's kind of, let's not go there, but because it doesn't actually have a conceptual model. We know that it's just bits inside the memory, uh, but then it can encode it back again onto a screen for the barista to read. And so you can, that's where you would insert the computer and the reality is that ordering process. That's the use cases that you're trying to model. Um, okay, so now I forgot where I was going to go with that. But I feel like that's an important uh, kind of model of models. Like this is what's going on. You're, you're decoding an encoding. You're decoding some information that's like recorded somewhere into a model inside the machine's memory and then you're able to re-encode it. And the fidelity with which you can decode and re-encode is important because it's a game of telephone. You got hops going on here and you wanna get the right coffee out at the end. And so you need to have no like ambiguity. You need to have no uh, you know, bad, uh, un invalid coffees that are getting being able to be written uh, in that process, so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I hope I hope that helps. Like, there's a reality going on there, and that's what you're really trying to see. And there's two steps. There's the when you walk into a Starbucks, the menu is is you know fairly well designed. It's good enough that it serves the business's purposes. But like I said at the beginning. Before Starbucks, like coffee was just some big uh, amorphous blob of stuff. And you could walk into a coffee shop and be like, can I have like a little darker roast? No, a little, a little darker than that. You know, you could just have infinite variations of roast, infinite sizes, um, infinite add-ins. You can put whatever you want in coffee. Why did they choose those five, right? And so it takes a different kind of skill to walk into one of these domains and 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 really see what's going on right really be able to say oh if we if we could write down a specific roast then we could serve that to people and that's different from the size of the coffee and like it takes a real skill to do that it takes a lot of knowledge of the domain to be able to parse out those concepts from it so there's this that's the first step and often it's done for us because we start with like legacy software right we started a new job at an old company um but then there's the second one which is you take the conceptual domain which has already been fairly well established and cut up into concepts and discretized and everything and turn it into an encoding that's a second step Right, and that encoding and decoding has to be, uh, it has to be very um, truthful to, you know, it has to be able to, it has to work all the time. Encode, decode, you don't want errors in it. Let's put it that way. Does that make sense? Am I, I'm, I feel like I'm losing people here. It, it makes it seem sense. like you could measure, or, I'm sorry. Maybe measures the wrong word. You could compare different models based on how many, how many, I guess, transformations you have to make. 
possible states? No, no. Transformations between different models. Ah, between equivalent models? Yeah, well, okay. So um, in a previous slide, you showed the version of vector, yep. vector and the version with maps. And the real difference was kind of the complexity of the transformation. Like uh -huh. how much effort did it take to transform from one to the other? Mm -hmm. And if you take that up a notch, you can judge the entire order coffee between how many, well, from a process standpoint, you say steps or people, but you can also judge it based on how many mental models you have to jump through and transform between and compare equivalents. Mm. So that, that, that slide that you just put up, I think is exactly right. I was working on this issue just last week for my own stuff, and I think it's about the number of states. Total states system or total states relative between the, the encoding and... yeah so like so you have the conceptual model basically how many coffees are possible to order that are you know different versus how many can i write down in my encoding and it could be that there's some coffees you should be able to order that you can't write down that's possible and that's a problem right? Because your business wants to have pe people are going to want to order those things. Um, there's going to be some times where you have more states that th you can write down more states than uh, coffees that actually exist, right? So like, you know, you could imagine something where you could say, uh, well, we don't have small dark roast, right? And so, well, now we have this we have to have an if statement in there to like disallow that from being ordered. We have to throw that in our validate function. Um, and then you have, sometimes you have ambiguous, you can write the same coffee down in multiple ways. And that's what the normalize function is for. This is uh, useful. I just want to say I've worked on C sharp projects. We've done DDD. Uh oh. I own the book and it's in mint condition. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we've done it, and uh, I think your explanation is interesting. Can I? Can you clarify what you mean by conceptual model? Because here's the deal: work with a lot of people, and they say I've got this great conceptual model, and then it's incredibly not reflective of reality. What? Are you working with social scientists? Every, <laughs> it is everyone who has opinions about software, and it probably includes me, and I'm blind to it. Will create them? They'll be like, "This is great. My conceptual model is an XML-based rules engine, which will support all these use cases." Or they'll say something like, "You know, I I have a conceptual model that handles coffee, and you can order a soda." And you're like, "Well, the sodas don't exist yet." And they're like, "Well, it could." Uh -huh. We're trying to sell the business on selling sodas by implementing a model that could potentially. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, your class soda also, extends for, drink. Right, from what I understand, your conceptual model is minimal, right? Like, if this is like the minimal set of possible things you could order, and if your conceptual model doesn't match that, then you need to go back to your conceptual model and think about how to make it more like reality. This okay, is a I'm going to interrupt real quickly yeah. and ask if we can let Eric finish his talk and then go into this. Yeah, that might be good. It's All very right. close, very close. <laughs> and, then, and then we can grill him. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. It's a good question, though. What's your name again? Peter. Peter. Okay. Yeah, good question. And I do want to talk about it because I think there's a lot there that, that I need to work on in, in my book. Um, all right. So, last level. So, okay, what happens is you realize, wait a second, like I've implemented all the use cases, but that there's still more because people are gonna be like adding and removing and like random orders. It's never just one use case. The use case was add soy, but like they're gonna be adding soy three times and then adding almond and removing soy. And like we need to model the composition of these things like how do they work together and so that's what the focus of level three is is look at the composition of functions 
And I'm calling it algebraic modeling, and I hope it becomes clear why in a second. So here's a little test we could do. So you have this coffee. Uh, it's small, light roast, no add-ins. I'm going to assert that that coffee is equal to the coffee that I get if I take that original coffee, add espresso, and remove espresso. That seems pretty fair, right? Like if, like if I add a thing and then remove it, I should get the thing I started with at the beginning. Um, and so we can actually replace that. Oh, I put a bracket there. Shouldn't it be a bracket? We can replace this espresso, what was here, espresso, with a variable. And we're, we'll say, this shouldn't just be for espresso. It should be for any of the ingredients, any of the add-ins we could put in. So we're just going to select a random one and use a variable. Right, so I'm replacing, um, you know, a, just like in math, where if you would replace a number with a letter, with a variable, here I'm replacing a specific add in with basically any possible add in. And that should still be true, right? But it turns out I could actually construct a random coffee too. It should work for any coffee, not just that specific coffee I wrote. So I'm replacing that specific coffee with a variable that is some random coffee. Okay, so that's why it's algebraic, right? And we should be able to say this, and you know, depending on how far you want to take this, how much assurance you want that what you're doing makes sense, um, we could say, well, it's not, just, it's not just for adding and removing a single ingredient. I want to be able to generate a random list of ingredients called add-ins, and I'm going to take my coffee, I'm going to add all of the add-ins to it. This is the coffee with line. I'm going to reduce this add operation, starting from coffee, add all the add-ins. Then I'm going to remove them all, and they should be equal to the original coffee. Then I could say, well, but you know what? I could go even further. And I could do add-ins prime and shuffle that list. I should be able to remove them in random order, not just, it's the same ones, they're just in a different order. And I should still get the same coffee. Okay, so this is the kind of, this is the kind of uh, reasoning you do at this third level where you are, excuse me, looking at the relationship between add, remove, and how many. Um, so th in this case, we're saying the, how many of this particular add-in, whatever it happens to be, it could be any add-in, this is the first line of code here, how many of that particular add-in are in the coffee? It has to be less than if I, oh, I should have had in how many in here. Let me, I stopped sharing, hold on. Let me share it back. This should have a how many around it. And this should have a how many. How many add in? Oh, lovely. There we go. Just debugging everybody's story. Debugging my slides as, uh, as I present. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's right. All right, so then this one I should say if I um, remove an add in, it should be let, there should be fewer of those in the coffee. Uh, so this is, you can see how this is starting to have a, you're, you're starting to talk about the relationship. How do they relate together? How does adding and removing add-ins relate to how many and to, and to each other? Uh, so what about relationship of add with itself? Well, I can say, you know, I stop and think about it and I say, well, if I take a coffee and add A and add B, it should be the same as if I take the coffee, add B and add A. 
relationship and remove itself. Same, same with this. Okay. So that's actually my last slide. So that's it. Now we can now we can have a fight. <laughs> I actually, real quick on this level three before you move on. Uh, yeah. What is the benefit? I think there is one, mm. but what is the benefit of doing the algebraic modeling? Right. Uh, so I should have written that up at the top. I'm going to jump back to a previous slide. Uh, this one. The goal of level three is to support unforeseen use cases. Generalizing? You're generalizing it. So you're saying, look, we thought of the use case of adding an espresso and removing an espresso, but we didn't think of the use case of uh, the server accidentally leaning on the remove espresso button and like adding 50, right? Or removing 50. And we can, we can uh, accommodate it. We can make sure that that's possible by just generating random, um, I mean, this is property-based testing stuff, but you generate random uh, sequences of operations, random adds and removes and test them make sure it works for all those cases that you wouldn't have thought of so if if we are modeling a subset of reality is the third step effectively sort of i guess simplifying the implementation of that model and through that simplification also generalizing it to you for more of these cases because you're effectively you could write a function for each transformation like remove for coffee remove for everything else and then you go to the step of generalizing and you have a remove that handles all of these things hmm. the cost of implementation has gone down and the speed at which you can model more of reality has gone up and you can sort of model more scenarios. So is that effectively a way to, like, I guess, to my that, previous point about measuring a model based on the uh, the transformations you have to go through, is that effectively making a model cheaper and thus faster and easier to implement um, as it scales? I, I believe it I, I believe I want it to be a way of making it making it cheaper and and more robust basically um, that I hope I can I can show how to do in a general way it does I believe that thinking thinking in this way of focusing on the composition of the of the operations again without implementing them you just say what must be true is is a way of thinking about it in in an algebraic way because you're using variables so you don't really know which coffee you have so you have to think about like what can i say about any coffee that would be passed in that is the idea is to get people thinking that way because if they do it at all it's ad hoc and by the usually what i this is what i see is like people have already decided i'm going to use an array for this and so now it's simply like oh i have to implement this new method but i've already got an array like what how do i get it done right and they can often get it done but then it's unclear you know just by brute force they can figure out and they're testing like five or six maybe even 20 test cases on that method but they haven't ever thought how is this thing going to be used in concert with other things they're simply trying to solve the next test case and they're usually very simple and they're they're hindered by the the previous choices of data structures that they have 
And so they're, they're dealing with a lot of constraints here when they really should be thinking, look, I'm trying, what am I trying to do? And like, what do I want to guarantee about that? And if they're thinking at that level, then I, I, I think that that's where like software design wants people to go, but doesn't, isn't really pointing that way. That's, I, I think that's my, that's my hypothesis right there. Um, I hope it so, answers your question. I want to jump in here real quickly before we sort of conclude and move to the broader discussion uh, about the algebraic modeling. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, I kind of have two questions. Um, uh, one more specifically on algebraic modeling is how do you figure out um, uh, which behaviors, operations, properties you're trying to model? Um, I don't think there's one way. Um, I think that it depends on what you're, excuse me, what you're doing. Um, you know, if you're doing something that's, you don't understand, you're a programmer, you're just paid to, to write the software, you have to go talk to experts who do understand, right? And try to, try to get around the curse of expertise that they can do this, but they're not very good at explaining it and so you have to like draw it out of them and here and this is kind of an answer to peter's question um i think that it really helps <laughs> trying to make it a stronger statement it's too late for me to do that it really helps to write the code down to make it concrete that a lot of times what happens is people stay in the conceptual model and they've never written it down in any kind of formalized way. And so they're in, you know, they're architecture astronauts is a word for that. Like you're just, you, you just got all these ideas, but they're un, untested. They're untested against reality. And one part of the process or the skill that I want to show is that you can write it down in code and actually implement it in a very naive way at first and get a prototype really fast. And um, that prototype, you could even like refactor it, like not even, not even hard transformations into an actual production application if you follow these steps. So if you, if you do this little bit of analysis before you choose a data structure, and before even that, you write down the signatures of all the use cases that you want. It's code, remember, it's all, the, it's all in code. And then of course, before you do that, before you like, you know, figure out how to implement it from the signatures, you actually look at like, what are the laws and the, the properties of the operations that I want to maintain. If you do that, you, you're always in code. Like this, this, what I've showed is always code and you can like show the expert, look, is this what you mean? Right. Or like you're, you could debug what the expert said. You can take what they said, build a model of it and say, ah, this function isn't really total. Like, am I missing something? And you go to them and they say, oh yeah, well, there's this other case that's like, I didn't tell you about that, you know, oh, well that makes this, I could encode it and that would make the function total, right? So it, I'm, I'm hoping that it gives, uh, all right. So this is again, answering Peter. I read the DDD book and I felt like there's there's a lot the, the guy who wrote this knows what he's talking about but is just like blurting out everything he believes and hasn't sat down to turn it into something real. And of course 
that's why there's like conferences about it because people are still trying to figure it out. Yeah. Um, it's, the whole, it's, industry. It's, it's a whole industry. It's a whole industry. Yes. Like, what did he mean? Let's talk about it because it seemed good at the time, but I'm still trying to understand it. Can and so, say, what, there's only two good chapters in that book. After looking back at it, oh, there's so many conference <laughs> talks, <laughs> which I've watched all. Of them. I have watched all of the conference talks, and they were more informative than the book i've been told yeah, yeah, yeah. i wouldn't know the book is a mess it's a mess uh i mean design that was the part he still stands by are we gonna like end the recording so we can get to the fun stuff <laughs> the the thing i want a few questions uh, sure. with the recording and then sure. we'll end it and really go at it <laughs> um no, the thing i'm not holding back anything so, what, can I interrupt here for a second? Yeah. Because yeah. after the recording's over, I need to ask Peter about a comment he wrote in some code uh, of <laughs> like two years ago. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, the thing I want to do with this book is to give people the actual nitty gritty on the ground. How do you build the model? Because domain driven design. Like it has a few good points, like go talk to an expert, make a prototype. Um, like your words might mean different things to different teams. Like there's good ideas in there, but the nitty gritty of how you do it uh, is, I think just, it's just not described at all. Um, or it's very cryptic and it's very object oriented as well. Uh, so I'm trying to make it like less, less cryptic. Like here's the nitty gritty of how you do it and throw in stuff like what I'm calling runnable, uh, runnable specifications. Like if you, if you start with the function signatures that you want, instead of like just having to refactor based on like the arguments that you have, you can, you, you can actually make it look like a spec. You can just write your, write your code, you know, like write your spec and run it basically. So I, I'm going to, um, thank you very much for the talk right now. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, we are going to do a pause and then ask some questions. So thank you very much. This is great. I'll do a few questions on the recording and then we'll stop the recording and really go at it. Um, so who wants to ask the question on the recording? I've, I've got a few, but uh, I have a question. I don't know if, if I can jump in. Uh, I guess it's, it's maybe not so much a question. I mean, so one thing that I really like, that really appeals to me about this is it feels like it's like the anti GitHub copilot. So I actually like copilot a lot, uh -huh. but like, this is the kind of thing that GitHub copilot can't do. And so this is a terrible question because I'm asking you to prognosticate, but like, what does this say about like the future? I mean, I really, I think this is the future. I think this is great, but I mean, what does the future of programming look like this for, for people working in, in programming and in code? I mean, is it, is it going to be like high level languages that do data modeling very well and we pass it off to an AI that handles implementation? Is that, is that, a, is that out there? I mean, I think it would be cool if you could skip straight to the last level and just say, okay, we've got these operations and this is how they compose and computer figure out for me how best to represent this data. Um, so that, you know, it's got the right algorithmic complexity, but I could also easily decode it in a JSON and, you know, you just have all these constraints and it could figure it out. Yeah. I mean, that seems, it seems plausible today, maybe a few months ago, it didn't <laughs> seem very plausible, but I played with chat GPT and it seems to do some pretty cool stuff. I, I, I guess I, I'm, all I'm saying is that this seems to be like a, a good future proof approach to programming, which I, I think is great. Uh, in that sense. So, okay. Thank you. Sorry, uh, the only thing that comes to mind is the scene from Office Space. It's like 
why can't the customer just talk to the engineers? <laughs> It's like, <laughs> people. <laughs> I'm a people person. <laughs> it's like, why can't the business users just talk to chat GPT? <laughs> well, they will. Um, um, okay, so uh, a question that I had um, sort of early on when you were talking about um, basically domain modeling, figuring out sort of what's really going on in your subset of reality. Um, so I do a lot of uh, database design work and database work. And, and I remember, in, in, so maybe this isn't a fair question, because in, in one of your podcasts, you talked about, like, I'm not really a database person. Um, but, you know, I use them all the time. Um, but Designing a relational database is also very much about modeling the domain. Mm -hmm. And when I would do this, so, so I actually was employed where I wasn't a DBA. I didn't do the optimization, I modeled it. <laughs> and a lot of what I did, and a lot of this was like back in the 90s, was go around and talk to everyone in the company about like, what do you do? And how are we going to model this? And all a database designer? Sorry? Or architect? It was basically a database architect, but yeah, I didn't have to. I didn't have to optimize anything. I didn't worry about the indices and all that stuff, which was great. Um, Logical data model. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Right. Exactly. And so, one of the big issues to get into with um, database modeling is because it's really expensive to change it. And anytime you change it, everything on top has to change, right? And they've invented all these, you know, intermediate layers now to sort of try to manage that. Um, tons of people then end up trying to abstract out the database. Um, and, and so like you get these wonky, I've seen it, like wonky databases where they're like column type, column value, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Six normal um, form. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. And so I'm, I guess there just seemed to be sort of a resonance when you were talking about the main modeling about sort of getting to the truth mm -hmm. in a sense as something that's fundamental. And I'm wondering about that issue of you get it wrong. Right? It'd be great to fully be able to model what is a coffee, mm -hmm. but we get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then you get all these sort of qualifications and this mess and you know, building on top of that. And, and I guess I don't have a specific question, except do you have thoughts about that? And, and how easy is it to fix your domain model? Right. So about getting it wrong, I hope that, I hope it was clear, it probably wasn't, that the whole level two and level three are about getting as much information as you have at the moment available to you so that you can make better decisions about how to data model. Right. So before you jump in and say it's an array, or it's a vector or a map. Hey, go through your use cases, like just one at a time. What is it like if I use an array? What was it like if I use a, a hash map? Oh, this one does a linear search. Maybe hash map is better for this operation. Just like getting all that information to help you constrain the problem to like the right model. I mean, there still could have choices, but it helps you, gives you fewer choices that would work. Um, and then if you go to the, the third level, you're seeing even more like, oh, we're going to have to be adding and removing these things really a lot. So, you know, maybe that changes it, changes it somehow. Um, so I think that, I think that that's, that's, uh, it, it's trying to avoid getting it wrong. Okay. Um, and even maybe reveal stuff that you wouldn't have seen like, huh, oh, this function can't be total with the way I've encoded it. 
And so I, you know, that, that probably wasn't apparent when, if you just sat down and tried to draw your tables, you know? Um, but then of course, yes, I think that you were right about like, often we try to draw the tables in the abstract and we haven't really analyzed enough of the domain. We're kind of like, Oh, this is a person. Of course it has this, 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 this field. And you know, really is that true like maybe a person has multiple addresses don't just put an address right on the person record you know right in the post person row uh, like a street one street two like you might want a little bit like a join going on there um okay that said i i think that there's also this idea of volatility and i'm I'm calling, uh, like, when I say volatility, I'm talking about predictable volatility. So if you go to, you know, the coffee shop manager, and you're like, how often are we going? You say, look, we have three sizes. Are we going to get a fourth size? Can I hard code these three sizes in there and, like, bake them into the tests and everything? They're going to say, oh, yeah, no problem. We have three sizes. But if you ask them, how often are we going to get a fourth size or will one of these change? They might tell you, well, you know, we have this special where we have like the mega cup. Every six months we introduce it again. Like, aha, uh -huh. you see, like it's not so fixed, right? Do you want us to have to do a commit and a deploy every time you want to introduce the mega cup? Uh, and so I think that, I think that there's a, there's like, I think the best I can do is point people to show them that like, there are ways of modeling that are easier to change. Like if you put it in the database, instead of hard coding it, it's easier to change. So like <coughs> when you're looking at, should I use a, should I hard code this as a type, right? Which you might do in Haskell. Uh, like, think about it. Wait a second. That's, that's fixed. Like I have to do a deploy to change this. Maybe you should go ask your boss or whoever the product owner, whoever it is like, Hey, can we, are we going to do that? Same with like the ingredients and stuff. How often do those change? Maybe they're more often throw them in the database. Um, yeah. So that that's a kind of like that's not getting it wrong as much as looking ahead to the future. And I feel like this is another thing I didn't mention that software design gets wrong. It's like change is a boogeyman. That's just like, "Oh no, it's these requirements are going to change." Like, yeah, but did you did you ever think like maybe like you could figure out some of the ones that are going to change ahead of time and like model that as part of your model? Um and it seems to me that they don't. They're just like surprised by everything. So along those lines, um, and actually we discussed this briefly now I'm thinking about over email, it is in my own work when I'm trying to model social life, one, one of the things is trying to distinguish between what is absolutely fundamental and cannot be removed mm -hmm. versus what is tran transitory or ephemeral in some way. And uh, what I found is, is that's a really fundamental difference. Mm -hmm. when, when, when there's something that I say, this characteristic you cannot remove from whatever I'm trying to model, uh, that, that helps me make that distinction. Um, yeah, I like to think about like, is this your business or is it all coffee business, right? Is this, is this a library that anybody could use or is this like just for you? Cause you like to have, you know, a certain kind of sale, a certain kind of promotion. And, um, yeah. So it distinguishes two levels, two layers is the domain layer and your business rules layer. Well, and I think that that's a distinction that a lot of people have trouble with. It's like, what is fundamental about selling coffee and what is just what we do today, right? 
So I love that it's a uh, humongous size enrollment period. That's what you add support for, and then you'd have like from February through March. And we tell people it ends at March, but it actually ends April first. Because you got to give them a few hours in case they're past midnight. So put that in your app. You've got a humongous size enrollment period. You can have it with only large, and then you can have a humongous size available for a limited time. All right. So you hard code the special case. No, no, no. They, it's data. They enter more enrollment period. Now, can you modify an enrollment period? That's a question you have to ask the business. I say you hard code it all and speed up your your uh, deployment, deployment process. Uh -oh. Because it is so. We've got a radical. So wait, can can I interrupt for a second? Yes. Because the code I've been working on at my day job. Oh, it. Peter's commented the code from years and years ago. By the way, Peter, do you remember writing, this causes an N plus one problem, but we have bigger fish to fry? <laughs> As you wrote that, and I just want to tell you, I'm frying a much bigger fish than you ever imagined at that point in the code. I, I, I also want to say roughly around the time that column was written, we had checking the number of items in the cart, uh, ran something like a thousand or a million queries. I can't actually remember the number. Of <laughs> <laughs> it was either a thousand or a million queries that hydrated the entire domain model. <laughs> well, so it's not that bad, but I am making the N plus one problem in particular worse, but it's for a good cause. But it, it, here's how this relates to the discussion that we're having, because so my view of the world is really warped by the fact that most of my career has been working with organizations after they got it wrong in their domain model. Which I completely agree about the tenant, like the domain model is generally pretty set, right? And the business rules change. So, Okay, I don't want to like give anything away here, but imagine that you were selling products, right? And, and maybe you were going to sell them on different sites, right? And so you might have a description of the same product on one website that's different from another website, right? You might even have different prices and all this other stuff. You might think it's a good idea to encode things so that you test strings for equality. But here's here's the big takeaway I want to tell people. The closer the thing you're doing is to the computer, the farther it is away from reality. So strings don't exist in the real world. They're entirely something we make up as software developers to help us deal with stuff, right? So string equality is never actually the requirement. And if you ever get to the point where you have to describe things in multiple languages, that will be brought home to you in, in great detail. Anyway, so I, I would encourage people to, when they do their domain modeling and they're doing this stuff, the functions that are like, there's a whole list of functions that actually make sense in the real world. People actually do process lists from the start to the finish. Like, that's a thing people do, right? However, people don't assume that the characters B-L-U-E always mean the same thing, right? Because if it's a color, it's a color. And if it's a mood, right, it's a mood. Like, I'm blue, I'm depressed, right? And so just when you're doing all this, I think it's a good idea to kind of stay as far away from the array, string, right? The closer you get to something fundamental to the computer, the further you away you are from reality. Uh, uh, unless you're you know, like modeling a computer, which is a whole different thing. <laughs> it models all domains. It's the easiest way to do it. Okay. No, thank you, John. Off I, the rails I, I, at I this point, and so, so I'm just, just settling some scores. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Stop the recording and then we can go totally off the rails.
So thank you so much. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Now give me just a moment to figure out how to actually stop the recording. And... Wait, wait, wait. You had to stop the recording? <laughs> no, key. I don't really care. Like, we'll edit this whole part out, and they're not joking. So they're, <laughs> Stop recording. And then you're listening to it.